Welcome to Iowa, home to farmland and cutting edge biomedical research using raspberry pies? Yes, actually. My dad and I took a road trip to the Gearling Lab here at the University of Iowa, and no, I'm not making any of this up. My brother is a neurologist, and his lab studies brain structures. When he told me they use raspberry pies for some of their research, my dad and I had to come check it out. First, dad asked my brother about what kind of research they're using the pies for. Joel, like, what is the password to like your computer? <laughs> I could tell you, but I have to kill you. <laughs> So, Joel, we came up to see this nose poke world and the Raspberry Pi use, but what, what actually is that used for? So we test the region of the brain called the parabrachial nucleus, and it receives in information about everything going on in your body, from the temperature and itch and pain information coming from the skin to information coming from your guts and your heart and your lungs and your throat and your mouth. And one of the things we want to test is the behavioral side of things. So blood pressure control and breathing control are influenced by neurons in this area, but also your sensation of things and the, the decisions that you make with that information. The main thing we're testing right now with that, with that apparatus is the decisions animals make based on temperature changes in their environment. And how does the nose poke come into play in that? So we can't talk to mice, unfortunately, and mice, are the, that's the species we study. And so we have to design tests that, where they have to make a choice and we compare their choices against statistical chance. And if they're choosing one thing more than the other, that suggests that they are choosing it for a reason. If we control the, the temperature, for example, and they're choosing to switch on a heat lamp, then that gives us, they're able to sense the environmental temperature and they're able to respond to it. Dad also asked about whether the code and designs would be open source or how other people could replicate the results. And Joel had some pretty strong opinions on that. Open source design and open source software are more and more appreciated and I think in the future going to become the gold standard because one of the most powerful tools we have in science is reproducibility. Mm -hmm. If your work is reproducible by other people, then it's useful. Mm -hmm. And if it's not reproducible by other people, then it's not useful and it might not even have been done very well. But when we publish the work, we publish all the methods and all the software and all the hardware components, and we don't use components and we don't use software that other people can't get readily. In all of this, this particular project especially, like how would that eventually, how do you see that affecting humans? This information we get from our body gets used by our brain to influence our mood, to, get, to influence the decisions we make, and to know which neurons do which things we need to test the function of the neurons with cause and effect exper experiments where we turn the neurons off or remove the neurons, turn the neurons on under our control, and then we need to be able to test what's happening in the mouse. You know, mice are limited in the cognitive capacity. You know, they, don't, they don't do a whole lot, but they do things like build nests and run away from the uncomfortable temperatures and run towards a more comfortable temperature. They huddle together in groups, and they do that in response to the same things that we would do those things. Those are very old, evolutionarily old uh, responses. So my brother talked about why they were doing the research, but I also wanted to know how. So I asked Phil and Grady, the graduate student running this research, how he and his dad built the test rigs. So we needed to set up a chamber so that the mice had a very controlled temperature at all times. We wanted to record the neural activity from their brain as we were manipulating the temperature, as we were cooling them down and warming them up. And so to do this, my dad helped me by building out what he calls a mouse air handler. To cool the air down, we have this radiator from a car, and I have it hooked up to a fountain pump and a bucket of ice. It takes this cold water and runs it through all this tubing and then through the radiator. And then this fan blows the cold air through the radiator and then past a couple of uh, resistors in here, some nichrome wire. And I have control over that nichrome wire with the Raspberry Pi, which allows me to turn them on and turn them off at will. So the big advantage of this setup is that the mice don't know what's happening. The only thing that changes for them is the temperature of the air. It sounds the same when it's warm and when it's cold. There's not any extra stress going on. So this Raspberry Pi measures the temperature. We have two temperature sensors here. Here's the external one, and there's an internal one inside of there. It controls the nichrome wire, the resistors, with a PID loop. So when it gets a little too cold below its set temperature, it ramps up the heaters. When it gets a little above the set temperature, it ramps down the heaters. The environmental control chamber is used to measure how neurons in a mouse's brain react to rapid temperature changes, and they can actually see that information live. But they also built a nose poke chamber, where they can monitor how mice behave, whether they want more heat or are content as is. So this is our operant heating chamber. This is what we use to test how the mice learn. 
And so the way this works is pretty simple. So inside of here is a nose poke. So the mouse can run around in here just like this, and he can stick his nose into either of these ports. And if he sticks his nose into this port, nothing happens. If he sticks his nose into this port, then the heat lamp comes on. So in addition to having the negative and the positive nose poke, we also do this with experimental mice and control mice that have not been manipulated. And we also do this at room temperature, as well as a warmer temperature and a colder temperature. So when we do this at a warm temperature, the mice don't need the heat, they don't want to poke. But when we do this at a cold temperature, they'll sit here and poke all day. These are connected via serial port with our Raspberry Pi in here. So once again, we've got another power supply to power it off wall power. Um, we've got a real-time clock and a relay. And at the bottom here, we've got the Raspberry Pi. And so um, this reads the voltage changing off, the, um, off these nose poking devices and then sends it um, sends voltage either to the heat lamp. So right now I'm recording the data to this USB, but I could also use VNC to get in and view the data. You, you can't do this with off the shelf parts. I read a paper where they used a similar technique where a mouse nose poked and he got a, a heat reward. And I was just really interested by it. I think that that sort of behavior is the most interesting thing about using live behaving mice as compared to doing cell culture or something like that. And so I just really wanted to try that experiment. It's not perhaps the easiest experiment to pull off. And it took me, me quite a while. My first try at building this was a Raspberry Pi soldered together on one of these boards. And it didn't work great. And I actually fried that Raspberry Pi. Yeah. By putting a static charge on it. <laughs> and so my dad luckily stepped in and he helped me build this. And as you can see, it's everything I could ever want. Yeah. So this one, I actually started off building on my own. And the first few passes were pretty ugly. And I finally got it to work, but it was just very temperamental. There were wires hanging out. It wasn't enclosed at all. <laughs> and so my dad stepped in and offered to help me build this better version. Um, so he actually did almost all of it without any input from me. <laughs> I just gave it to him and let him go. And this is another thing that my dad really built without any help from me. So I just told him, you know, I needed to be able to change the temperature for a mouse without scaring the mouse. And he said he could do it, and then we let him go. But as you can see from this, this is the AHU-6. <laughs> so there's, there were five iterations before that. I also asked Philan if he thought these sensors could hold up against the industrial sensors they could have bought for a lot more money. I think these are just as good as the industrial sensor. In fact, I think they're better. They communicate over a serial port. There are five volts, which is a much more common standard than what the company used. They're made out of plastic as opposed to metal. But, and we, initially we were worried that the mice would get in and start nibbling on the edges of it. <laughs> but that doesn't seem to happen. So I think they're just as good as the $300 version. Philan told me his dad designed everything from scratch. So we called up his dad and I asked him about his background and how he helped. Hi, I'm Mike Brady. I'm a software engineer. Uh, I'm a proud papa of a University of Iowa graduate student. And I am the, uh, the father of the nose poke, which is a revised nose poke uh, that uh, can record when a mouse puts his nose in a hole. So what is your background that, that led to being able to build something like this? Um, I'm an electrical engineer, Kansas State University, 1983, and um, I was trying to make it robust. Philan's original thing had a bunch of uh, parts laying on the bench, and I was afraid he was going to electrocute himself. So uh, step one is I put it in a plastic box so he couldn't do that. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm not a heating and cooling expert by any means. Can you explain how you thought up to use like the car radiator part and all that? Well, I used to work for a HVAC company um, when Philan was a newborn uh, in Texas. And um, so it's routine that a commercial building like the one you're standing in has air handlers that provide air at the desired temperature and humidity. So what I have built is just a shrunk version of those. So um, the gray plastic that's used on the nose poke is called ASA. It's a, a better kind of plastic. More difficult to print, doesn't melt quite so fast. And the heat exchanger 
I had several ideas for a heat exchanger, but Philin wants this rapid drop in temperature. You know, the first iteration had 15 minutes time to drop and that wasn't good enough. So um, that heat exchanger is a $30 $32 heater core from Advanced Auto Parts. For both designs, they center around a Raspberry Pi as kind of the general controller. Was this one of your first projects using a Pi, or have you used Pis before? What is what's your background with uh, working on that kind of system? Um, my day job is embedded software, so smaller computers than that. Um, the Raspberry Pi I picked uh, because it was quick and cheap, and um, Phil and loves Python, so I thought it would be a native for him to play in Python. Um, that and you know he's doing things with that that I wasn't expecting, like having the embedded controller directly make graphs. Um, normally, that's more than we do in the embedded world. Yeah. Uh, we we you know provide data with uh, over the network somehow in packets, and then we let a PC do graphing. But I guess Python is such a strong, you know, a powerful embedded computer; it's able to do that. So in the end, you have two new Raspberry Pi powered test devices advancing the state of the art in medical research so we can learn more about how our bodies react to the environment around us. I was happy to hear this lab is going to release all their methods, software, and hardware design as open source on their GitHub. My brother made a great point about open source. Good science stems from reproducible results, and making experiments where anyone could do it without buying thousands of dollars of industrial hardware means reproducibility is more accessible and the science is more sound. You can learn more about the Gearling Lab on their website or Twitter. Check out the links below, make sure you subscribe, and I'll see you next time.